Awesome, awesome. You know, our heart's desire is that you would come not only to learn the Word of God, but that you'd come to love the Word of God, and most importantly, that you'd learn to live the Word of God. And, and, and I'll tell you what, it will revolutionize your life. When you learn God's Word and you learn to love God's Word and you're living it out, it changes your life. It changes your life. And so I'm excited. We are beginning our campaign and, and just looking forward to what God is going to say to us and, and the, the things that, you know, we're going to be challenged in and where we're going to grow in. And I pray, as you've heard me say, you know, at the beginning of the year, our vision for this year is depth, that there would be deep roots, that we would grow deeper in the Lord because there can't be width apart from depth, right? In order for God to continue to bring growth to this place and to our lives, there needs to be depth, and so God wants to do that. Uh, you know, in, the, in the, the December edition of Time Magazine, 1974 and 1995, the cover to both of these editions raised uh, questions that I'd like to raise today. And the question is this, for the 1974 edition is, how true is the Bible? How true is the Bible? And then in 1995, Time Magazine, once again, cover story, their question was this, is the Bible fact or fiction? Is the Bible fact or fish, fiction? Now, a lot of people will read this and they might take offense to this, but these are actually valid questions. These are valid and legitimate questions that deserve an honest answer. They really do, especially for those who are new to coming to church. You know what I mean? Because, again, we stake our lives on this, and, you know, they have to wonder, what are they staking their lives on? What is it? Is it really true? How can I know that I can trust the Bible to be the very Word of God? We know that the Bible claims to be the Word of God, right? We also know that the Bible claims that it can be trusted, but how can I really know that God's Word can be trusted, and it is truly the Word of God. And it's not just a bunch of stories. It's not just a bunch of fables that people made up over the years and put in a book and now has just been passed down, and so we take it as fact. But how do we know it is actually fact? And so this morning, I'm hoping to settle that with you and to give you some tangible things to really hold on to because there are incredible proofs there are incredible uh, evidences, concrete evidences, under, undeniable, excuse me, facts that really testify to the validity of the inerrancy of Scripture, the, the validity that this is indeed the living Word of God, that you can build your life upon this. I mean, I mean, I tell you what, if this is not true, then none of us, we're wasting our time, you know, and we're just wasting our time. But there are proofs, there are evidence, and there are facts that you can know and be absolutely assured of that the Bible is indeed God's Word so that you can choose for yourself to believe it or not. You can choose for yourself, and not just based on what I've said or what other people have told you or what you may have read, but that you can make a solid decision for yourself because at the end of the day, that what, that's what it all boils down to. It boils down to your decision to choose whether to receive it or not, to believe it or not, right? You choosing to believe it or not. Because even with all the proof that I could give you and that we're going to talk about through this campaign series, even with all of the proof, the evidence, and the facts, you still can choose to reject God's Word. You can still choose to reject God's Word. There are a great many people in the world, in spite of the facts, in spite of all the evidence, in spite of the concrete truth that has been presented to them, still reject the Word of God. They still do not receive it, even though they know that there is undisputable facts, right? And, and again, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. It boils down to your choice. And so this morning, my prayer is that I could help you make up your mind for yourself. Again, not based on blind faith like a lot of the world tries to say, oh, these Christians, they just put their faith, it's a blind faith in these empty stories, but that's not true. And so I'm praying that I can help you make a decision, you know, based on what the Bible claims for itself, based on the merits of, of uh, historical proof, scientific proof, prophetical proof that we're going to look at this morning. And so I pray that you would walk away from this place understanding like you have something that is hard 
tangible, solid, concrete proof and evidence that this indeed is true, that this is true and that you could trust your life. You can trust your life to what it tells you to do. And if you do, as Jesus said, you will be blessed for the doing, right? He, he didn't say blessed are those who hear these things or these sayings of mine. He says blessed are those who do these things. And again, as I said at the very beginning in my introduction to the series last Sunday, that's my heart for you. My heart for you as your pastor or as a pastor is that you would be blessed. I want you guys to be blessed in every area of your life, in your family life, in your marriage life, in your, your professional life, in every sphere of your life, I want you to be blessed. But the only way that's going to happen is when you take what God says seriously, and it's not just something that you hear, right, but it's something that you put hands and feet to, and that's where the change begins. And so with all of that, I want to begin today part one in our campaign series that we're calling Rooted, and as we answer the question, how can I know that I can trust the Bible? How could I know? I want to give you six reasons. and I'm going to go pretty quickly because there's a lot of information here, but one of the points I'm going to spend the majority of my time, but I want to give you six reasons that I'm going to uh, look at this morning. So if you're taking notes, number one, the Bible, we can trust that the Bible is the Word of God because the Bible is historically accurate. It is historically accurate. This is one of the greatest reasons I know we know that we can trust the Bible. In other words, the Bible isn't just doctrinally correct. It's not just theologically correct. It's not just morally and ethically correct. It is historically correct. In other words, this Bible speaks of real people, real places, real time. Real people, real places, real time. Why is this important? I'll tell you why. Because God cannot lie. A lot of people say, well, can, is, there, is there anything God can't do? Absolutely. There's a lot of things God can't do. God cannot lie. God cannot deny his word. God cannot deny his name. God cannot deny his son. There's a lot of things God can't do. But one of the main things God can't do is God can't lie. Hebrews 6.18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. And so if there's something in this book that's not true, then guess what? We could say that God is a liar, right? But there is nothing untruthful in this book because God cannot lie. That's what the scripture says. Psalms 33, 4 says this, God's word is true and everything he does is right. God's word is true and everything he does is right. That's not only true for our salvation, but it's true and right about history, about history. How do we know that the Bible is historically accurate by the same way you know that any other historical event is accurate, right? You go by the test of good history. What is the test of good history? One of the ways you test history is from eyewitness accounts. That's how you test history, eyewitness accounts. A historian would ask, is it written down by somebody who saw it firsthand, secondhand, or third hand, or is it just a legend with no proof that just got passed down the ages? Because there's a lot of legends, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of Greek mythology. There's a lot of that stuff that are just legends, right? But there, there's no substance or truth to those legends, right? But are there actual eyewitness accounts of these things? And, and that's what the Bible primarily is. The Bible is an eyewitness account book, firsthand. And this is why it's good history. You know, Moses was there when God parted the Red Sea along with Joshua and all the other people who saw it. And so guess what? They recorded it. They wrote it down because they saw it. Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho fell down. And so they recorded it and they saw it firsthand. The disciples of Jesus sat in the upper room and saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, right, physically appear right before them. And they wrote it down and they experienced it personally. And a lot of people can say, well, how do we know that's true? Let me tell you, a lot of these disciples ended up giving their lives for this, right? Prior to Jesus' crucifixion, what does the Bible say? They all scattered. Why? Because they were afraid. But once they saw Jesus resurrected, all of a sudden they were bold in their faith to the point where they laid down their lives. Let me ask you a question. Would you lay down your life for a lie? Absolutely not. That's how we know this is historically accurate because they saw the resurrected Christ and knew it and they wrote it down. 
Matthew was a personal eyewitness of Jesus' life. He wrote it down. John 2. Listen to what John actually says in 1 John chapter 1. And I've read this to you before, but it's powerful when you listen to it word for word. John says this. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, he says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. Look what he says. Whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He repeats this over and over. He is the word of life. This is the one who is life itself, was revealed to us. And again, he says it. And we have seen him. We've seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. Look what he says again. He says, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He says, we have seen, we have heard, we have touched. And he says it over and over over again. We have seen, we've heard, we've touched. We know it's real. We are convinced it's real because we've seen it, we've heard it, we've been touched by it. It's true. The point is the Bible is founded upon good history from firsthand eyewitness accounts of what had happened. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says there were over 500 eyewitnesses who saw Jesus resurrected. 500. And so again, you know, this is how all good history is verified. This is how we know George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, the same thing. This is how we know how Abraham Lincoln was killed. Eyewitness accounts. Same, that's, how we, that's how we do good history. The other test of history by which we know the Bible is accurate is the extreme care the Bible was copied. The Old Testament copyists, they were known as scribes. Scribes. And when they would copy from these scrolls, It had to be exact. It had to be exact. And they had this long list of rules that they had to go by to make sure that it was exact and always right. And they had this rule that you had to copy, not word for word, but you had to copy letter by letter, right? Letter by letter and not word by word. They went by these tests to make sure that it was right after they copied it. And they knew, as a matter of fact, how many alphabets were in that book. And so if they were copying the book of Isaiah, they knew all the alphabets in that book. So for instance, if there was a letter A, let's say the letter A, they would know that there were 1,653 A's in the book of Isaiah. And if it had 1,654, guess what? They would throw it away and start over again. That's how dead accurate it had to be. They were so exact you know, about a a great many things, but these are just a few ways that ensured the absolute accuracy of a copy. There were so many things that they did to ensure that what we have is untouched, right, that it truly came from God. Another proof of the uh, accuracy of the Bible's history is archaeology. How many of you ever watch those shows where they're uncovering things? I, I really am fascinated by those shows. But when you look at archaeology, it proves again and again that the places, that the people, and all the things that the Bible talks about are real. Now, I'm not, you know, if you came from this background, I'm not here to down it, but I'm here to speak the truth. If you open up the Book of Mormon, right, I'll tell you right now, and you try to find the cities that they talk about, you try to find the artifacts, they have not found one thing, not one thing in archaeology that verifies their belief system. Not one thing. Everything that the Bible talks about, guess what? They have excavated. They have found it. It is, it is sound. Archaeology proves it. You know, where you can actually go to these places. The Areopagus, where Paul was, the theater in Athens where, he was, where there was this big riot. You can go there today. As a matter of fact, the pool of Siloam where Jesus heals the blind man in Mark chapter 8, verses 22. I was there in Israel where that happened. You can go there. Why? Because it really exists. In the book of Acts, it's all about historical accuracy. Luke was a historian. He was also a physician who wrote the book of Acts where he talks about 54 cities, 39 countries, nine different islands, right? All of which are verified. Every single one of these cities. Every single one of these countries, nine different islands, all of them, they're accurate. You can go there today. 
One of the great things about how archaeology works with the Bible is how it again and again and again proves its authenticity. Every day, and I've been to Israel a few times, but every day when you, uh, you, you know, they say that they're always uncovering new things that the Bible speaks about, down to the coins, down to the cups that they use, to the plates, to the, the weapons they use, they have excavated every single one of these things. It's crazy. For instance, along for a long time, historians questioned the validity of Solomon's life. They questioned the validity of some of the things that it said about Solomon as far as him having over thousands of horses. And so they were saying, that's impossible. That can't be true because back then the, the form of travel was not horses, but it was camels. And so they tried to, you know, uh, uh, dis, you know discredit the Bible by saying that this is not true. Well, until uh, at, at Megiddo, this was an uh, ancient, ancient city in north Israel, archaeologists uncovered one of Solomon's chariot cities, and they had thousands of stables for horses. Thousands. And so again, proves it to be true. So the Bible was proved to be right in every one of those things. And so historically, we have a powerful historical proof in our hands, right? You can go to the, uh, Israel yourself, which hopefully one day as a church we can. If not, go there. Go there and you can see these things for yourself. And it's, it's crazy because not only do you, you know, Pastor Chuck Smith always used to say, going to Israel is like going to seminary for a year. And the reason why is because you not only get your theology, but you get the lay of the land. You get to learn archaeology and geography and archaeology and geography proves the authenticity of your theology, of what you believe, right? And that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important. But again, we have something solid in our hands. It's beautiful. The second reason I can trust the Bible is not only is it historically accurate, and this is the point I'm going to spend some time is, the Bible is scientifically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. There is so much misunderstanding and baloney about this because a lot of people in, secular, in the secular world will tell you, you know what, you can't trust the Bible because it's not scientifically correct. That's baloney. That's not true at all. As a matter of fact, anyone who says that tells me one of two things. They've either never studied the Bible or they don't really know science. All you have to do, again, is look at history and you'll find out how scientifically correct this book is. Now, let me just clarify some things. The Bible obviously is not given or intended to be a scientific textbook. It's not. So it's, it, you're not going to learn how to build a rocket by reading uh, uh, this. You may talk to Pastor Darren, and he might be able to help you with that. You know what I mean? But you're not going to learn that here in the Bible. Nor does the Bible use scientific language, okay? Because it wasn't intended for that. It wasn't intended for that. But not once in the 3,500 years in which this book was written does it give bad science. It doesn't give bad science. In fact, the Bible is always ahead of science. I'm going to prove that to you. It's always ahead of science. There are things in the Bible that the Bible says are true that we have just discovered within 100 or 200 years that it is actually factual. Jonas Kepler, the famous mathematician and astronomer, said this, science is simply thinking God's thoughts after him. In other words, God established the laws of physics and then we discover them. Right? That's what he says. God established the laws of biology. God established the laws of mathematics. And we just discover them. And one of the reasons why we know the Bible can be trusted is because it's scientifically accurate. It's scientifically accurate. And we know this because the laws of the universe were created and they were established by God. They were established by God. For hundreds of years, the so-called experts and scientists have been wrong about a great many things. About a great many things that the Bible has always been right about, you know? And the thing about modern science, how many of you know that it's constantly changing? Modern science is constantly changing. There's nothing more worthless than an old science book. I mean, you can go to any garage sale and you probably find these books and they're worthless. You know, I guarantee you the science books that you had in elementary school, in junior high, they're not using today. They're not using today, you know why? Because they've been proven not to be true. A lot of things in those books are no longer believed or even practiced or taught 
You can find them again in the trash, in a garage sale, at some used old bookstore, but they are worthless. They're worthless, right? The science that we're taught and thought we believed, we now know is not true. In fact, how many of you know medical science is constantly changing? Think about this, right? How many articles have you read that now say something that you thought was good for you causes cancer? I mean, everything this was good for you, all of a sudden there's this new report, oh, this thing causes cancer. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of things that they would say, oh, pregnant women can eat this. Years later, they're saying, nope, this is not good for pregnant women because this is going to hurt you, right? Even now, I hate to say this, but even now, they're talking about this vaccine and all the things that it's causing, all the problems that it's causing, the sicknesses that it's causing. Again, again, science is constantly changing, constantly changing. As a matter of fact, I just read an article two days ago, two days ago that said, orange juice isn't as healthy as it seems. Experts say, science says, it shouldn't be considered a healthy food. Here's why. Orange juice is condensed. It contains just as much sugar as Coca-Cola and can lead to blood sugar spikes, weight gain, and cholesterol. I mean, so those of you who have just bought some new orange juice, sorry to tell you, science says it's no good for you, right? It's crazy, but it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing. You know, in Paris, at the Louvre Museum, right, there, this is a world-class museum, right? There's one section that has three and a half miles of obsolete science books. Three and a half miles of science books that are obsolete, that, are, that just don't no good no more, right? Things that they thought were a scientific fact 1,500 years ago have all been disproven in the last 1,000 years. I mean, think about that. The same is true with much of our science today. What experts thought was a scientific fact 25 years ago, much of it has been proven to be false today. That is a fact. Much of what we thought 10 years ago that we believe it, that was, was fact, realized today, oh, that's not a fact. It's constantly changing. Now, here's the thing. If you had read the Bible 1,000 years ago, think about this, or 700 years ago, or 500 years ago, what the Bible says would not have matched the science of that day because the science wasn't up to date. And so they would say, oh, this is not true because it doesn't match the science. Well, guess what? Now they're finding out the science of the day actually says what this book says, which is crazy, right? Listen to what the Bible says. Psalms 148 verses 5 and 6 says this. Let every created thing... That's the whole universe. That's the whole universe. Give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command. In other words, God set the rules in motion, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of physics, the laws of gravity, and look what he says, and they came into being, and he set them in place forever and ever, and his decree will never be revoked. The laws of gravity don't work today and not work tomorrow. Why? Because the laws of gravity have always worked, and the truth doesn't change. It doesn't change, right? In 1861, there was a very famous book that came out called 51 Incontrovertible Proofs That the Bible is Scientifically Inaccurate. This was a very famous book. The only problem is, 150 years later, you can't find a single scientist on the planet, and this is a fact, who would agree with any of those in you know, con controvertible facts because they've all been disproven, every single one of them, right? The point is the truth does not change. And one of the proofs that we know the Bible is not simply man-made but is truly the Word of God, listen, is by what's not in it, by what's not in this. For instance, for thousands of years, do you know that people believed that the earth was flat, People believed that the earth was flat and that when you got to the end of the earth, you could actually fall off the earth like it was a cliff. And that's a fact. They believed that. It wasn't until Columbus, it wasn't until Galileo, um, you know, stepped on the scene and did their world travel that they discovered that the world is not flat, but it is round, it is a sphere, and it is a ball. There's not a single verse in the Bible that tells us that the earth is flat. You know why? Because the earth is not flat. 
There's not one verse. As a matter of fact, listen to what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 22. When science was saying the world was flat, this is what the Bible said. God sits above the circle or the sphere of the earth. The Bible was saying that the earth was a circle. It was round. It was a ball. It was a sphere. It wasn't flat. But science said it was flat. That's what they believed it was, right? 2,600 years ago, the Bible told us that the earth is round. It was a sphere. Long before anybody knew it or believed it, God said it, and it was true whether people believed it or not. Why? Because the science of the day is not necessarily right science. The Bible is always ahead of science, and so you cannot say that the Word of God is scientifically incorrect. Do you know this? For thousands of years, people also believed that the earth had to be held up by something. They believed that. They believed that something was holding the earth. Depending on the culture that you were from and where you were raised, what you believe may have varied. For instance, Greek cultures believe that the world was held up by a giant named Atlas. You've all seen that guy holding the earth, you know, at the flower stores. That's what they believe. The Greeks believed that Atlas was actually holding the earth, right? But Atlas is not in the Bible. Do you know why? Because it's not true. It's not true, right? It's not true. Do you know that Hindus believed for thousands of years, and you can look this up in encyclopedias, but for thousands of years that the earth sat on the backs of elephants. That's what they believed. And every time that there was an earthquake is because the elephants were moving, they believe that, right? That's what they believe for thousands of years, right? Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, the Bible tells us, as you guys know, Moses, he was adopted into Egyptian culture. He was the grandson of Pharaoh. And he was educated in the greatest schools of Egypt. And Egypt, the Egyptians were, they were brilliant. They, they, had, they were geniuses. They built the pyramids. They, they were masters at architecture, engineering, astronomy. But as intelligent as ancient Egyptians were, they were dead wrong about what they believed held the earth up because they believed that the earth was held up by five pillars. That's what e Egyptians believed, that there were five pillars that held the earth. And there's no doubt that Moses was taught this because he had gone through Egyptian education. Yet not once in Scripture will you find the earth is held up by five pillars. Why? Because it's not true, and Moses came to know that, right? Right? The point is, the prevailing science of the day is not in the Bible because God cannot lie. God cannot lie. But let me tell you what the Bible does say. Look at this. Job 26, verse 7. God stretches the northern sky over empty space, and look what it says, and hangs the earth on nothing. He hangs the earth on nothing. When people go to the moon and they're looking at the earth, what, do they see five pillars? Do they see these elephants? Do they see Atlas? No, they see the earth just there. How did Job know that? How did he know that? Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He knew it because this is God's unfallible truth, right? Who told Job? It was God who revealed this. The Bible always tells the truth, right? Again, I'm reinforcing this because it's sheer nonsense to say that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. And so for somebody to say that, they don't know the Bible. They haven't studied the Word of God, because if you study the Word of God, you will find that it is not. Anyone who says that just doesn't know the Word of God. For instance, for years, it was accepted science that there were about a 1,000 stars in the sky and that the stars could actually be counted. You can check that out. They believe that. Well, guess what? That's not what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Jeremiah 33, 22, the stars of the sky cannot be counted. And guess what scientists are saying today? They're saying that there's too many stars for, for, to ever be counted. There's just too many stars. But the Bible always said that when science was saying that you can count how many stars we have. Again, it's just too numerous. I could go on and on on so many different areas in, into biology, chemistry, medicine, and look at what the prevailing science of the day was versus what God's word says. I mean, even in medical science, do you know that before when you were sick, they believed that, you know what, how you, how you heal somebody is you bleed them out. Look, look this up. You would bleed them out, but people would start to get sick. But the Bible says that life is in the blood. And so today, what do we do to give people life? Blood transfusions. 
Bible has always said that life is in the blood. You don't bleed someone out, but life is in the blood. Again, so we can talk about a great many things, but again, it is not scientifically inaccurate or medically inaccurate. The Bible is accurate. What you have in your hands, ladies and gentlemen, is sound. It is sound, and you can build your life on this book. Now, let me move on. I'm going to move quickly now, right? And so we know that uh, historically accurate, archaeology confirms it, scientifically accurate. But the third reason we can trust the Bible is the Bible is prophetically accurate. It's prophetically accurate. What exactly does that mean? It means this, that the predictions of the Bible always come true. They've come true. The Bible is filled with literally hundreds of prophecies where God says, this is going to happen at such and such a time and in such and such a way, and it's come true. Over the centuries, hundreds of these prophecies have already been fulfilled. There are some that haven't yet, but hundreds of them have been fulfilled to the T, to the date, to the exactly as the Scripture says. There are over 300 prophecies, for example, in the Bible about Jesus as our Messiah over a thousand-year period. Do the math with that. How is that even possible? The prophecy about when he would be born, when, where he would be born, how he would be born, and not only that, but how he would be put to death. P- prophetically, over a thousand-year period, do the math. It's impossible to get every one of those things right. Where you're born, how you're born, right? I mean, again, how you're going to die. What are the odds of, of making all of those predictions? Over a thousand years. That's impossible. I mean, you probably win the lottery before you win that. You know, before you figure that out. But the odds are so astronomical, you couldn't write the number down is the point. It takes more faith to believe that it was just by chance or coincidence than to believe that God planned it. I'll tell you right now, it takes more faith to be an atheist than to believe in God. It takes a lot more faith to believe in nothing right, than to believe that there was an actual creator behind everything, right? Peter says this, 2 Peter 1, verses 21, for no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. Jesus himself said this, all, this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in Scripture, right? Again, During Bible times, believe it or not, nobody wanted to be a prophet. Do you know why? Because a prophet had to always be right. If he was wrong just one time, he would be called a false prophet. And not only that, he would be put to death. And so nobody wanted to be a prophet. This is why people were running. This is why Jeremiah didn't want to be a prophet. This is why a lot of the guys didn't want to be a prophet, right? It's funny, but today we have a lot of people, they may not be called prophets, but that's what they really think they are, right? like these psychic people. You know, let me just give you a a food for thought here. If you ever feel tempted to talk to one of these people, you know what, and they ask you your name, don't tell them your name because they should know because they're psychic, right? If they're asking you for your credit card, you should tell them, you should know my credit card because you're psychic, right? And so, again, that's how you know it's false. It's just ridiculous, right? Like, oh, you know what, do you have a mother that's named Jane or whatever, they go down the list until finally, bing, 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 you know, Tom, John, Rick, whatever, you know, do you, I think you have a brother named Tony, Fred, George, They're, you know what I mean, it's just, it's hilarious, again, if you're a psychic, then you don't need to do that, because you know exactly all of those things, and so don't fall into that, all right, again, we can trust the Bible, because it is prophetically accurate, prophetically, number four, Fourth reason we can trust the Bible is the Bible is confirmed by Jesus himself. Uh, This is very quick. Jesus trusted in Matthew 5, 18. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Until everything is accomplished. Jesus looks at the Bible and says, it's going to last until the end of time. It's going to accomplish everything all that God set out for it to accomplish, right? And so, I mean, we can trust the Bible because Jesus himself affirmed that this was indeed the word of God. Number five, the Bible, uh, we can trust the Bible because it has survived all of the attacks. Do you know that over the years, people have actually sought to destroy this book? They've sought to destroy it. 
The Bible is the most despised book. As much as it's most loved, it is also the most despised, the most derided, the most denied, the most disrupted, the most dissected, the most debated, and the most outlawed book in all of history, in all of history. You know, millions of people have actually been killed for their faith because they would not deny this. They would not give it up. They have been put to death because of that. You know, the Bible was illegal in many places, and believe it or not, the Bible is still illegal in some countries today. Today, if you were to take a Bible into North Korea, do you know that you could be imprisoned? You could be imprisoned for that because you were carrying a Bible, possibly even put to death. The Bible has been under attack for centuries by everything and everyone you can imagine, yet it is still the most read book, the most published book in the world, the most translated book in the world, and to this day, I mean to this day, is the best-selling book. It's the best-selling book in the world today. There's not a book that has outsold the Bible. The Bible is the greatest source of truth, and not only is it the greatest source of truth, but is the greatest source of inspiration. Think about this. The Bible has produced some of the greatest scores of music. The Bible has produced the greatest collections of art. The Bible has produced the greatest architecture the world has ever seen. If you take the Bible out, right, think about what we lose. We lose great scores of music, the greatest collections of art, and the greatest architecture edifices. Because, man, great men were inspired by the Word of God to do these beautiful things. And so you take the Bible out, those things are gone. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The only thing on this planet that's going to last is the Word of God, is the Word of God. And this is why when I sit down and counsel people, let me tell you, I don't give you my opinion because my opinion doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. I'm going to tell you what this says. Why? Because this is tried and true. It's tested, right? I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you God's counsel. And that's what you guys always got to be aware of. Who are you listening to? Who are you talking to? Are they telling you what God's word says or are they giving you, you know, secular philosophy? You know, they giving you, you know, you know, their secular ideology, their belief system or their opinions. Is it pop culture? What are, what are you basing your life on? Again, be careful what you're listening to, what you are putting in your life and what you're building your foundation upon. Again, you can trust this. And so this is what we're going to give you here. The only thing, again, that's going to last is the Word of God. You know, it's interesting. You know, Voltaire, how many of you know who Voltaire is? Voltaire was a French philosopher of the 18th century who was a harsh critic of Christianity. He was an atheist. 100 years uh, from today, he said that the Bible would be forgotten. That's what he said. This is, he said this in the 18th century. Not only was he dead wrong, but everybody's forgotten that quote and forgotten that guy. They don't even know who this guy is, right? As a matter of fact, you know what's the irony of this? After Voltaire uh, died for nearly 100 years, his home was used as the book depository for the French Bible Society. And today, I mean today, um, you know, his house is a museum for the Bible. <laughs> God, it's like, you know, who's going to get the last laugh? God is, right? So he was saying that in the 18th century, he was saying that 100 years from today, the Bible's going to be forgotten. Oh, I guess you were wrong about that, right? And so, he, he, you know, God was laughing as he said that because he's saying, yeah, I'm going to make your house a museum for my book. You know what I mean? It's crazy. Jesus said again, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. 1 Peter 1, 24, 25 says this, the grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but the word of God endures forever, right? The truth will always be the truth, whether I believe it or not, it's the truth. You know, God said it, that settles it, whatever I believe it, or whether I believe it or not, it's the truth. And that's the thing. Because whether I believe it or not, it doesn't change anything, right? You can say you don't believe it, it doesn't make it not true. It still is true. The last reason, and the one that I love the most, that we can trust the Bible, is the Bible has been transforming people's lives throughout the centuries, throughout the ages, right? Changing lives. And I can tell you, my life has been changed because of this book. 
I came from a very dysfunctional home. I was not raised in a, in a you know, a godly home. Um, you know, I had to deal with my own stuff. But I thank God for this book. I did not learn how to be a husband or a father or anybody from my father because my father wasn't around. I learned how to be a husband. I learned how to be a father based on the principles of this book. And that's the truth. I am who I am because of the truth in this book. And I've lived my life based on this. I don't care what people say. I don't care what people think. This is what God says, and this is what I'm going to do. And let me tell you, it's been tried, and it's true, and it works. It works. My life has been changed. You know, Kathy and I, we've been married for 37 years by the grace of God. And let me tell you how dysfunctional we were. We were dysfunctional people. But because of the goodness of God, we stand here, and, and God is, is, has done beautiful things. We have a beautiful family. I have beautiful kids, beautiful grandkids to testify to the goodness of God based on his truth. And those of you who are sitting here who know God, you know this to be true because you could look at your family. You could look at your marriage. You could look at your children. You could look at your lives, and God has blessed it. You can say amen to that, right, because you know it's true, because you know it's true, right? That's the power of God's word. That's the power of God's word. This is why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verses 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power unto salvation. It's what changes people. It's what transforms people. And so, I mean, God's word is a beautiful thing. It changes lives. I've seen drunks, drug addicts, prostitutes get their lives clean and sober because they got into this book and they began to love it and live it. That's what God's word does. That's how, how powerful it is. He says that his word is a double-edged sword, pierces the heart, soul, even down to the marrow of the bone. That's how powerful God's word is, right? And so let me tell you, if I thought that you could change human behavior by laws, I would have become a politician. But I don't believe politics will ever change the world. I really don't, right? I have zero faith in politics to actually change have lasting, lasting change. The only thing that you can, that'll bring the kind of change that we need to see is, again, the truth of God's word. You can make a law that outlaws racism and bigotry, but no law can change the heart. No law can change the heart. Only God's word can change the heart of man. It's only the word of God. And so I've invested my life in the heart-changing business. People often ask me, hey, what's your business? What's your line of work? I tell them, I'm in the business of people and change lives. I'm in the business of people and change lives because I give them and feed them and teach them the word of God. That's my business and that's my life. I believe this book that much. The last thing I ever thought I would be would be a preacher or a pastor. Trust me. That was the last thing I ever thought I would be. And yet here I am because this thing changed my life. Almost 40 years ago, I was at the, uh, I was at the Olympics uh, Kathy and I were walking, and somebody was preaching the gospel. And I laughed at him. I said, look at this idiot. They were passing, you know, and as we were walking away, I was making fun of him. But as he was preaching, his words were <laughs> pounding my heart. They were penetrating my heart. Because with every word that I mocked him with, that I laughed at him, the word of God was pricking my heart. Because I would tell Kathy, I would say, he's an idiot, but that's kind of true. You know, look at this stupid guy. He's standing on the park bench and he's, you know what I mean? But yet, as I was walking away, listening to what he was saying, it was, man, it was penetrating my soul and my heart. And it wasn't long after that I came to faith. God's word is powerful. And the Bible says that God's word will never return empty. It'll never come back void, but it'll always accomplish what it's set out to accomplish. And here I stand today, the one who mocked God and mocked his word preaching and declaring it to you. That's the power of God's word. That's what God can do. Jesus said this, John 8, 31, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I find it interesting that secular universities all around the world have the second half of this verse printed on stone on many of their buildings, right? The truth will make you free. It's sad because they ignore God and they ignore 
and dismiss the first part of that verse. The first bar- part of that verse is, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and then the truth will make you free. It's sad that they take out the first part, because you can't be set free unless you are abiding in that truth, right? And so the beautiful thing about God's word, whether I agree with it or not, whether it hurts me or it's uncomfortable, it'll always tell me the truth. And that's why we call this the Holy Bible or the Holy Living Word of God, because it always tells the truth. So let me close this morning. You know, the fundamental and most important question you're going to have to ask yourself this morning is this. What's going to be the final authority of your life? Ask yourself that question. What's the final authority of your life? You need to decide that question. Is it going to be the word of God or is it going to be the world? What's the final authority of your life? Am I going to listen to what God says is true or am I going to listen to uh, the opinion polls of people, pop culture, secular philosophy? What am I going to, what's going to be the authority of my life? I mean, who's going to be the authority of my life? And that's really the question. Who's going to be the authority? God or you? God or you? Because when most people say, I don't accept this book, it's not that they don't believe it's true necessarily. That's, that's, that's not it. The reason why people don't want to accept God and accept this book is because they don't want anybody telling them what to do. They don't want to be accountable. They don't want to have to answer to what God's word has to say. And so they reject it because they don't want to be, they don't want God to be the boss of their lives. That's their mindset. And so they want to be the boss. They want to be the Lord of their lives. They want to be their own, you know, the one who dictates what they do. They don't want God telling them what to do. They don't want to hear what's moral and what's immoral, what's right and what's wrong, right? They want to do what they want to do. And so you have to decide What's going to be the authority of your life? Because today we live in a day where we're calling it moral relativity. How many of you know what that means, moral relativity? Moral relativity means that I decide what is right and wrong for me. I determine what is, what is moral and what is immoral, right? There is no moral absolutes. That's what our society teaches, which is completely wrong. Because you and I both know there are things that are absolutely wrong, such as murder, that is absolutely wrong. That is absolutely, you know, that's a, there's a right and a wrong to that. Lying and stealing is morally wrong. It is right and it is wrong, right? We can say that. And so for some people to say, well, uh, morality is relative. That's ridiculous. That's not true because there is an absolute truth. And this morning, you have to decide what is going to be the authority of your life, regardless of what secular society is telling you, regardless of what you hear on the news, regardless of what people are saying? You have to decide, is, is what this says, is it true? Or is it what they're saying is true? Because again, if you want to be blessed, then you're gonna, do, you're gonna live by this because Jesus said, blessed is he who not only hears these things, but does these things. And so the big question is, why is the inerrancy or the infallibility of God's word so important? If this book is not true, then we're all in a lot of trouble. But thank God that it is true. And listen to what the Bible says, and I close with this last verse. Psalms 19, verses 7 through 9. The law of the Lord, look what it says, is perfect. It's perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. The statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Why can we trust this book? Because of all those things. It is historically, it is scientifically, in everything, in every, it's all proof and true. There's evidence, there's facts. And so you could base your life on this and be blessed and successful in what you do if you build your life on the Word of God. But as I said, I could present you with all the facts, with all the evidence, but at the end of the day, you still have to make the choice whether or not you're going to receive it or not because you have a free will. God has given you a free will to make choices and decisions for your life. But your choices, mind you, 
will dictate the course of your life. Choose well. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for your word. I pray that we would leave this place with absolute assurance that your word is indeed the word of God, Lord, and that by living your word, Lord, our lives will be blessed in every way imaginable. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would just continue to bring depth and growth, that you would teach us not only to learn your word, but to love it, and most importantly, to live it. And so bless your people, Father. Do a work in their hearts. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Why don't you stand this morning as we worship and prepare for communion. Amen.